Now we have data storage technology. In this topic, we have the following learning outcomes in which we have to learn one by one for this. In the previous module, you were briefly introduced to the topic of storage, including the role of storage in a computer system and the differences between primary and secondary storage. So, in this module, you explore storage devices and their underlying technologies in depth. Also, this topic outlines the characteristics common to all storage devices and compares primary and secondary storage technologies. A storage device consists of a read or write mechanism and storage medium. The storage medium is the device or substance that actually holds data. The read or write mechanism is the device used to read or write data to and from the storage medium. A device controller provides the interface between the storage device and system bus. In some storage devices, the read or write mechanism and storage medium are a single unit using the same technology. For example, most types of primary storage use electrical circuits implemented with semiconductors for both the read or write mechanism and storage medium. In other storage devices, the read or write mechanism and the storage medium use fundamentally different technologies. For example, the tape drives use an electromechanical device for the read and write mechanism and magnetic storage medium composed of polymers and metal oxides. A typical computer system has many storage devices. As you can see in this figure, storage devices and technologies vary in similar and in several important characteristics, which includes the speed, the volatility, the access method, portability, and the last one is cost and capacity. No single device or technology is optimal in, or, in all characteristics, so any storage device optimizes some characteristics at the expense of others. A computer system has a variety of storage devices and each offering a cost-effective solution to a particular storage requirement. This speed is the most important characteristic differentiating primary and secondary storage. It's essential because the CPU must be continuously supplied with instructions and data to keep it busy. For example, a CPU with 1 GHz clock rate needs a new instruction and supporting data every nanosecond. As discussed in Module 1, registers in the CPU are storage locations for, inter, um, I mean for instructions and data. Their location enables zero-weight states for access, but CPUs have a limited number of registers. This is far fewer than are needed to hold typical programs and their data. Speed is also an important issue for secondary storage. In many information system, um, applications need access to large database to support ongoing processing. Program response time in these systems depends on secondary storage access speed, which also executable code um, 
It also affects the overall computer performance in other ways. Storage device speed is called access time. And this access time is the time required to perform one complete read or write operation. It's assumed to be the same for both reading and writing unless otherwise stated. Secondary storage devices read or write data in units larger than words. So block is a generic term for describing secondary storage data transfer units. Block size is normally stated in bytes and can vary widely between storage devices and even in a single storage devices. A 512 byte block is the most common data transfer unit for magnetic disks. The term sector describes the data transfer unit for magnetic disk and optical disk drives. A storage device's uh, data transfer rate is computed by dividing 1 by the access time, which is expressed in seconds, and multiplying the result by the unit of data transfer, which is expressed in bytes. Say for example, the data transfer rate for a primary storage device with 15 nanoseconds access time and a 64-bit word data transfer unit can be calculated as 1 second divided by 50 nanoseconds times 64 bits. That equals to 5,333,333,000 and 333 bytes per second. And this volatility, we can say that a storage device or medium is non-volatile if it holds data without loss over long periods and is volatile if it can't hold data reliably for a long period of time. Primary storage devices are generally volatile, and secondary storage devices are non-volatile. And this volatility is actually a matter of degree and conditions. For example, RAM is non-volatile as long as extend, uh, I mean external power is supplied continuously. However, it's generally considered a volatile storage device because continuous power can't be guaranteed under normal operating conditions. For example, during a system restart after installing an OS update. The access method uh, refers to the physical structure of the storage device's read or write mechanism and storage medium determines the ways in which data can be accessed. And there are three broad classes of access which are recognized. But a single device can use multiple access methods. We have serial, random access, and the parallel access. And this serial access storage device stores and retrieves data items in a linear or sequential order. Magnetic tape is the only widely used form of serial access storage where data is written to a linear storage medium in specific order and can be read back only if that same order. Now, for example, viewing the past few years recorded on a video cassette tape require playing or fast forwarding past um, all the minutes preceding it. This random access device, also called a direct access device, is not restricted to any specific order when accessing data. Rather, it can access any storage location directly. 
and all primary storage devices and disks. Um, storage devices are random access devices. The access time for a random access storage device may or may not be constant. It's a constant for most primary storage devices, but not for the disk storage because of the physical or spatial relationships of the read or write mechanism, storage media, and storage locations on the media. The parallel access um, device with parallel access can access multiple storage locations simultaneously. Although a RAM is considered a random access storage device, it's also a parallel access device. And this confusion comes from differences in defining the unit of access. If you consider the unit of data access to be a bit, access is parallel. That is, random access memory circuitry can access all the bits in a byte or word at the same time. Parallel access can also be achieved by subdividing data items and storing component pieces on multiple storage devices. For example, some OS can store file content on several disk drives. Different parts of the same file can be read at the same time by issuing parallel commands to each disk drive. Portability. Um, The storage device portability is typically implemented in one of ways. The entire storage device, which the storage medium, read or write mechanism, and possibly controller can be transported between computer systems, for example, the USB flash drive. The storage medium can be removed from the storage device and transported to a compatible storage medium. Another computer, for example, a DVD. Portable secondary storage devices and dev devices with removable storage media typically have slower access speeds than permanently installed devices and those with non-removable media. Each storage device attribute described so far is related to device cost per unit of storage. For example, improving speed, uh, volatility, or portability increases cost per unit. All other factors are held constant. Cost per unit also increases as an access method moves from, uh, from serial to Random to parallel. Primary storage is generally expensive compared with secondary storage because of its high speed and combination of parallel and random access methods. Secondary storage devices are usually thought of as having much higher capacity than primary storage devices. In fact, Capacity differences between primary and secondary storage in most computers results from compromise between cost per unit and other device characteristics. For example, if cost weren't a factor, most users would opt for solid state drives rather than magnetic disk drives. However, most users need hundreds of gigabytes of secondary storage and solid state drives for this capacity cost more than most users can afford. So users sacrifice speed and parallel access to gain the capacity uh, they need at an acceptable cost. This figure shows, I mean this table shows the characteristics and their relationship to cost in terms of speed, volatility, this method, portability, and capacity.
And we have here the figure which shows the comparison of storage devices in terms of cost and access speed. The range of storage devices in a system forms a memory storage hierarchy where the cost and access speed generally decrease as you move down the hierarchy. Because of lower cost, capacity tends to increase as you move down the hierarchy. So a computer designer or purchaser attempts to find an optimal mix of cost and performance for a particular purpose. As discussed, the critical performance characteristics of primary storage devices are access P, the transfer unit size. Primary storage devices must closely match CPU speed and word size to avoid weight states. CPU and primary storage technologies have evolved in tandem. In other words, CPU technology are applied to construction of primary storage devices. Storing the electrical signals where data can or is represented in the CPU as dig digital um, electrical signals, which are also the basis of data transmission for all devices attached to system bus. And any storage devices or controller must accept electrical signals as input, generated electrical signals as output. Electrical power can be stored directly by virus, uh, various uh, devices, batteries, and capacitors. An electrical signal can be stored indirectly by using its energy to alter the state of a device such as mechanical switches or substance such as metal. An inverse process generates an equivalent electrical signal. For example, electrical current can generate a magnetic field. The magnetic field's strength can induce permanent magnetic charge in by metallic compound, thus writing the bit value of the metallic compound. To read the stored value, stored magnetic charge is used to generate an electrical signal equivalent to the one used to create the original magnetic charge. And magnetic Polarity, which is positive and negative, can represent the values uh, 0 and 1. Early computers implemented primary storage as rings of ferrous material, or iron and iron compounds, that is called a core memory. These rings or cores are embedded in two dimensional wires. I mean, the, the, the mesh wire, where electricity is sent through wires in a magnetic charge in one metallic ring. Random access memory is a generic term describing primary storage devices with following characteristics that a microchip with semiconductor, the ability to read and write with equal speed, random access to stored bytes, words, or larger data units. RAM is fabricated in the same manner as microprocessors. You might assume that Microprocessor rates are well matched to 
RAM access speeds. Unfortunately, this is not the case for many reasons, including the reading and writing native bits. In parallel, requires additional circuitry. And when RAM and microprocessors are on separate chips, there are delays when moving data from one chip to another. And there are two basic RAM types and several variations of each type. We have the static RAM and dynamic RAM, where this static RAM is connected entirely with transistors, where the basic storage unit is a flip flop circuit. And this dynamic RAM stores each bit by using a single transistor and capacitor, where capacitors are the dynamic element. However, because they lose their charge, they require a fresh infusion of power thousands of times per second. So this dynamic RAM chips include the circuitry that performs refresh operations automatically. So each refresh operation is called a refresh cycle. So unfortunately, DRAM can perform a refresh operation at the same time. Um, it performs a read or write operation. As you can see in this figure, Each flip-flop circuit uses two transistors to store one bit. Additional transistors, typically two or four, perform read and write operations. A flip-flop circuit is an electrical switch that remembers its last position. One position represents zero and the other represents one. These circuits require a continuous supply of electrical power to maintain their positions. Therefore, SD RAM, I, I mean SRAM, is volatile unless a supply of power can be guaranteed. The random access memory is used to bridge the performance gap between memory and microprocessors. It has the read-ahead memory access and synchronous read operations, where computer memory contains more than just SRAM or DRAM circuits. Memory circuits are grouped in those containing tens or hundreds of megabytes, and each module contains Additional circuitry to implement read and write operations. Random locations that circuitry must be activated before data can be accessed. Memory manufacturers have worked for decades to develop semiconductor and other forms of RAM with long term or permanent data retention. And the generic term for this memory devices is non-volatile memory or the NVM. Of course, manufacturers and consumers would like NVM to cost the same or less than conventional SRAM and DRAM and have far or faster read, uh, read or write access times. So far, these goals have proved but some current and memory show considerable promise. Early NVM technology involved several generations of devices. Read-only memory, the earliest type of NVM with data content written permanently during structure. This erasable Programmable room is manufactured blank, written with special 
from writer and erased by exposure to ultraviolet light. The latest form of room is electro um, electronically erasable, programmable room or e room. This device can be programmed, erased, and reprogrammed by signals sent from a signal. The main drawbacks of EPROM technology are low uh, density, high cost, and write speed that much too slow to be used in primary storage devices. The most common NVM in use today is flash RAM, where the flash memory it's competitive with DRAM in storage density, for capacity, and read performance. Unfortunately, write performance is much slower than in DRAM. Also, each write of is mildly resulting in storage cell destruction after 100,000 or more write of reasons. Other NVM is under development could overcome some shortcomings of flash RAM and two promising candidates are to resistive RAM and phase change memory. This is magnet to resistive RAM or MRAM. MRAM stores bit values by using magnetic one with polarity polarity that changes a bit. The other one is the phase change for the PCM, also known as the phase change RAM. This is the glass like found of germanium. Tellurium. That is when he said to correct them. GST can switch between amorphous and crystalline states. Memory packaging is similar to microprocessor packaging, where memory circuits are in the microchips and groups of chips are packed in circuit that can be installed or computer system. Early RAM and ROM circuits were packed in dual inline package for the DIPs, where installing the IP on a printed circuit board is a tedious and precise operation. Also, single DIPs mounted on surface occupy a large portion of the total surface area. In the late 1980s, structures of the memory adapted the single inline memory or the SIM as a standard RAM package. The edge of the circuit board has a row electrical contacts and the entire package is designed to lock into a SIM slot on the motherboard. And the newer packaging standard is the DIM or the Dual, I mean the double inline memory module. And this is essentially a SIM with independent electrical contacts on both sides of the module. Okay, which, as you can see in this picture, now current manufacturers of the microservices um, put a small amount of on chip memory. As fabrication techniques improve, the amount of memory that can Packed with a single chip will grow. The logical extension of this trend is placing a chip on its primary storage, chip, which would minimize or eliminate current gap between microprocessor clock rate, memory, and speeds.